Welcome everybody here tonight for the Island Foxtail with Ventura Land Trust. Um, this is the second in our um, digital environmental speaker series events. Um, these are public education events that we offer um, as part of our mission. And our mission at Ventura Land Trust is to permanently protect the land, the water, the wildlife, and the scenic beauty in the Ventura region. Um, for current generations and for future generations. And so this is part of that. Part of it is sharing what we know and highlighting the experts in our field. And we have two experts in our field here tonight with Friends of the Island Fox. Um, Carrie Dearborn is president of Friends of the Island Fox. Um, she started out uh, there as the education director in 2005 and um, now, she's, now she's the president. Um, and she has great expertise in environmental education. And Mike Watling is a friend of the Land Trust and he is with um, Friends of the Island Fox as an advisor and board member. Um, he's a certified California naturalist and a certified wildlife tracker as well. So we're gonna hear from them. Uh, my name is Leslie Velez. I'm the development director with Ventura Land Trust and I'll, I'll moderate this evening. Um, we are gonna leave questions until the end. But if you do have a burning question, I encourage you to use the chat feature. Um, I will type in a message here shortly so that the chat box comes up and you can write your questions in there and we can use those to guide the conversation and um, ask at the end. So welcome everybody. And without any further ado, I would love to hand the conversation to Carrie Dearborn. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, it's very exciting to be here with the Land Trust tonight. Mike has introduced uh, Friends of the Island Fox to the Land Trust, so we're excited to get to know you. And for you to get to know an island fox, this is actually an island fox right here next to me. This is a fox that was uh, unfortunately hit by a car out on San Clemente Island about 35 years ago. So she's one of our education taxidermied foxes that we can take out and show kids especially people who might not ever have a chance to get out to the islands. So she's just kind of our mascot here tonight with me. Um, I'm gonna introduce what Friends of the Island Fox does, how the Island Fox is unique, and a little bit about how it is an important species out on the islands, how it interacts with multiple other species out there on the islands, and how they came to be endangered. And then Mike is gonna go into the current conservation efforts that are going on with island foxes and also the current research that's going on with island foxes. So if you have any questions, we always love questions. Um, send those through the chat and we will we'll try to engage your questions as well as we go along. So with that said, I'm going to try to share my screen with you to show you our presentation. So Friends of the Island Fox is a nonprofit grassroots organization that is focused on helping foxes, the island foxes across all the islands where they live, across all the different land managers. And we came into being in 2005 after this catastrophic collapse of island fox populations across four of the islands where they live. So you can see that here, especially on Santa Rosa Island, we went from uh, a known number of foxes of about, estimated at around 1800, down to just 15 individuals between 1996 and 2004. So we had two islands where we had just 15 surviving foxes. Four populations that were really headed towards possible extinction. And the cause of these declines were not the same across the islands. They were, they were different, but both of them due to human impacts. So in the northern islands, we're talking about ecosystem collapse. This is, these are the islands of the Channel Islands National Park up there in Ventura. And then down on Catalina Island, the introduction of a lethal virus. But the really exciting aspect of the island fox's story is that the island foxes were saved. And that was because of a 
group effort, not only by the Island Fox Conservation Recovery Working Group, which are the scientists, the biologists, the veterinarians, but also nonprofit organizations, government agencies, but also local people, including school children and people who were going out to the islands to help with plant restoration, and all of those really dedicated biological technicians that are working with the foxes out in the field. So today, our island fox populations have recovered across those four islands, and we're seeing numbers that were never recorded before in history because prior to 1996, there's very little data on island foxes. So we're still trying to discover what is the optimum number of foxes on each island, how much can each island provide resources for, how many foxes. So you'll notice that the red line there, San Miguel, that number is always going to be a lower number because that is a much smaller island. And we're starting to think that that island is going to have a carrying capacity of about 500 to 400 foxes. So how is our little island fox unique, other than the fact that it's really darn cute? <laughs> and if you're going to be an endangered species, that's always a big help. They're only found on six of the Channel Islands and no place else in the world. So on each one of the islands with a star, we have an island fox population. Each one of those populations is also genetically different from each other because they've been isolated for several thousand years from each other. Now, during this time of COVID-19, when a lot more people have been at home, we've had a lot of people reach out to us saying that they thought they were seeing island foxes in their neighborhood. This is not an island fox, as most of you probably are aware. This is a gray fox. And what's really nice about this picture is it really highlights how the gray fox is different from the island fox. And the number one word to remember here is length. You can see this very long tail that stretches down to the ground, a long body, longer legs, a long muzzle, and really tall, long ears. The gray fox is the ancestor of our island fox, so the coloration is really similar. There are some small differences, but the coloration is quite similar. But you can see here that that gray fox, it's bigger, longer tail, longer legs, longer body. The island fox is what we call an island dwarf. So if you're a, a species of animal and you get stuck out on the island and you're typically about the size, you're, if you're bigger than this grande size cup, over time, you're gonna potentially get smaller. That's called island dwarfism. And so over time, that gray fox became the island fox and is what we call a island dwarf. So it's stockier, not as tall, but amazingly, it lives longer than its ancestor, which is very unusual for a fox, for any species that's gotten smaller. And across each one of the islands, foxes are slightly different from each other. So the Santa Cruz Island fox lives on the largest of the islands, but it is the smallest of the island foxes. If all of our island foxes were as small as the Santa Cruz fox, they'd be the smallest fox in the world. But some of them are larger. So the Catalina fox is a larger, more robust size fox. The San Nicolas Island fox is typically lighter in color because of the habitat that is more sandy where it's living. The Santa Rosa fox, longer legs, longer ears, because it's hunting mostly in grassland areas. So we see evolution in progress out there on the Channel Islands with these different subspecies of island fox. 
But another thing that they have that's different than their ancestor is their behavior. Island foxes are the top predator out on their island. So while the gray fox is typically active right about now, crepuscularly, uh, at twilight and then through the night because it has predators, the island fox is active around the clock because it has no terrestrial predator out there on the island. It's never had to worry about anybody else. It's, tip it's actually literally the top dog out there on the island. Which also gives us a really good opportunity to see island foxes out on the islands. This is some uh, trap camera footage that Mike took out on Santa Rosa Island. And you can see this is a little, well, it's hard to tell the sex of an island fox just by looking at it, but this is the little female island fox. And you'll notice that she is wearing a collar. We're going to talk about radio collars uh, after a bit, but she's also looking for food. Now, typically everybody thought, well, their ancestor is a gray fox. They probably are consuming the same resources that a gray fox would be consuming. So their food was primarily, they thought, going to be rodents. As you can see, that fox is eating and it did not find a mouse there. And because of the way it just squatted, we know that it's a female. She's actually looking for very small prey. And we really did not know what their primary food was until after they had gone through their near extinction period. Because when they came into captive breeding, we had to have an understanding of what they needed to eat. And a scientific uh, research project was done looking at the scat of island foxes across the islands. And what they discovered was that they were primarily eating insects. Their most frequent prey are insects because they can find beetles and Jerusalem crickets and grasshoppers year round. They also seem to switch their diet seasonally so that we see them eating deer mice in the winter when they're engaged in reproduction. We see them using small birds and their eggs as a prey source in the springtime, occasionally reptiles, and we're still really investigating the use of marine resources in their diet. It's really a big question. But nearly half of what they eat is actually native fruit. They're really good climbers. So this little guy is up inside a toyon out there on the islands. They can rotate their front paws, which the gray fox can do as well. They're the only foxes that can really do that. And it's a very cat-like trait because they are a very, they're the most primitive, the, the most like the original fox ancestor of any of the living foxes. So island foxes out on the island, they are eating a variety of native vegetation, native fruit. Basically any of these red fruits, the Catalina cherry, the toyon, the prickly pear cactus, the manzanita, they're consuming all of these different kinds of fruit, especially in the fall, because they're going to get moisture from those fruits. There's not a lot of available water out on the islands. So the island fox has this mutualistic symbiotic relationship with the native vegetation. So the plant is getting something and so is the fox. The fox, because it's a carnivorous animal, it's a carnivore, does not have the best digestion for eating plants. So it cannot digest those seeds. The seeds are going to pass right through its gut. And so it is the primary seed disperser out there on the islands. So really important for the whole population of plants and then all the other plant animals that are dependent upon the, the vegetation because they're the largest, even though they're tiny, they're the largest animal out there who's consuming the seeds and then spreading them.
Now, when we look at the islands today, they're beautiful, but there's been a lot of ecosystem damage out there over the years. And the ecosystem collapse that caused the island fox to nearly go extinct on the northern islands happened in steps so that it didn't happen all at once. And so the consequences of it weren't really obvious until the fox was in deep trouble. Initially out on the islands, when Northern Europeans show up, they start to use the islands for ranching. They can take domestic animals out there. There's no need for fences. And so animals can just be set free to roam and eat across the island. So we end up with pigs and sheep and goats introduced to the islands. The foliage hasn't had a, a predator, someone to eat it since the pygmy mammoth went extinct 12,000 years ago. So these animals start eating away all the vegetation on the island. That's one step towards eco ecosystem collapse. Then after World War II, we came home from the Pacific with a lot of DDT. It's really good at killing insects. It saved soldiers from malaria in the South Pacific, but when they started to use it agriculturally, and then when they started to use it around cities to kill insects, it started to get into waterways. And the bad thing about DDT is it doesn't just go away. You don't see it, but the particles of it stay in the ecosystem. They get eaten by small animals like invertebrates. Larger animals eat them. The toxic particles continue to move up that food chain until you have a fish eat invertebrates with DDT. The DDT builds up in the fish's body. And then the bald eagle, which historically lived out on the islands, which is a fish specialist eating fish and seabirds, it starts to then accumulate the DDT in its body. And especially for female bald eagles, this is a problem because it causes them to not be able to process calcium, creating eggs that when the birds sit on them, they just crush, they can't reproduce. So by the 1960s, Bald eagles disappear from the Channel Islands, and then they also disappear from California. But we do have a second large bird of prey that migrates along our coast every year as it's headed up into the northern parts of North America, and that's the golden eagle. This eagle is a mammal specialist. So it's prefers eating mammals that are about the size of a football. Rabbits, squirrels, ground squirrels, sometimes deer fawns, but when it comes across an island where there's a bunch of feral pigs, and we're talking around 5,000 feral pigs living on it, Santa Cruz Island, those piglets become the perfect food to attract golden eagles. Golden eagles had never colonized the islands before because bald eagles had lived there, typically in pairs, and so a pair would chase off a single golden eagle. But once that bald eagle was gone, that niche was completely open, and so golden eagles stopped, they stayed on the islands, and then they started to prey upon the island fox. So on San Miguel, Santa Rosa, and Santa Cruz, our decline from 1996 to, the, to 2000 is due to predation from golden eagles. They were eating the foxes into extinction. And fortunately, at the same time, the yellow line here, Catalina, that's that collapse because of an introduced virus. If these things had not been happening at the same time, probably the different land managers would not have gotten together to solve their problems. But they did, because initially neither one really knew what the problem was. 
it took a couple of years, it took about a year on Catalina to really figure out what the problem was. So because of that, everybody came together, they formed the Island Fox Working Group, and they brought all of the land managers from all the islands together, as well as resources from local universities, nonprofits, government agencies, everybody came together. The first thing that they decided to do was to put foxes in captive breeding on each one of the islands. They stayed on their own islands because they're each slightly different from each other and they were in these captive breeding pens. And on Catalina, they had to test a vaccine to see if they could protect foxes. And the typical dog vaccine is lethal to island foxes for canine distemper. So foxes had to be tested to see if there was another vaccine that they could use. And ultimately it was discovered that the same vaccine that they give to the endangered black-footed ferret in the middle of the country protects island foxes from distemper as well. So every year now, island foxes get vaccinations for distemper and also for rabies, at least a hundred of them on each island. But while the foxes on San Miguel and Santa Rosa were in captive breeding, it was as if they had gone extinct out on the islands. They were completely removed from the ecosystem, which provided a very important window into how the fox was interconnected to the island. Now we know the island fox is not consuming deer mice necessarily year round, but we know that they have an important impact on the mouse population because in our graph here, you can see this, the line, this is the island fox population going down to nothing. And we count deer mice or the national park counts deer mice out on the island two times each year. They count them in the fall after they've been reproducing all spring and summer. That's our high number for, island, for deer mice. Then over the winter, they're not reproducing. They have predation from foxes. They also are, have issues with the weather. There might be other things that happen with them. Their population typically declines to 100 per hectare or the size of a baseball field. And then typically over the spring and summer, they reproduce again until they get up to 400 for that same area, between 300 and 400. It's typical for their population to go up and down like that. But you can see as the foxes come out of the environment, the deer mouse population exploded. And when it dropped down to its fall, not its winter number, which should be its low, it still was higher than the typical high population. It goes up again and then we have a crash because the deer mice are eating all of the seeds from the plants that they need. The plants are not reproducing. They're eating themselves out of house and home. And when they're doing that, they start to change their own behavior. And here we have the high number of the deer mice. They start to consume the island song sparrow, eating its eggs and its chicks. So we see the deer mouse changing its role in the ecosystem, becoming a predator, which nobody expected starting to change the rest of the balance of the ecosystem on the island. On Santa Rosa Island and on Santa Cruz, island foxes have a small competitor who's smaller than they are, the little island spotted skunk. And the spotted skunk is more carnivorous. The island fox is very omnivorous, but the, the spotted skunk is more carnivorous. We think their numbers have always been less than island foxes, but we don't really know for sure. They're still studying that because we know when foxes disappeared on Santa Rosa, the skunk population multiplied by fivefold. They started going places where they had never gone before, where foxes had kind of always intimidated them and kept them out of those areas. They started to go down into sea caves and they started to prey on endangered seabirds that were living in those caves. 
on their chicks and on their eggs. So another whole changing of that ecosystem, a continuing of the collapse. So while foxes were in captive breeding, the island had to be restored somewhat in order for them to be safe to return. So domestic animals, the, de the sheep, the pigs, the goats, they were all removed from the islands. And then on Santa Rosa Island, we also had deer and elk that had been introduced to the island so that people could come there and hunt them and pay to do that. They were also removed by 2011. That's removing the food for the golden eagle. 44 golden eagles were trapped over the course of five years and relocated to Northern California, actually up there in Truckee, where one of our people in the audience is from. And during that time in juvenile bald eagles were reintroduced to the Channel Islands with the hope that they would be able to reproduce out there. So far they are, they're doing very well. We have had over a hundred bald eagle chicks now hatch out on the islands and the bald eagles are keeping the golden eagles away, which has kept them from the golden eagles from being a predator to the island fox. All island foxes were returned back into the wild by 2008. And you can see, if you look here on this graph, you can see 2008 when everybody's back out into the wild, they all start to reproduce more efficiently when people are not helping them. So we have these wonderful restored populations out there across the islands and a fantastic tale of how people can make a positive difference in the environment. So we're gonna switch back to Mike for just a second. And so Mike's gonna to talk to you about the current conservation that's going on with the island foxes and the research that we're doing. Because when we first started out with island foxes, we knew very little about them. Okay, Mike. Go ahead. You want to put up the presentation? Okay. You're dry. You're still driving. Okay. So when we talk about conservation efforts, um, what we're really talking about is research on behavioral ecology, reproductive biology. Uh, we're talking about uh, increasing fox, island fox education through outreach activities um, like this Zoom event and in classroom presentations. And this all plays into helping limit human impact to the foxes out on uh, the Channel Islands. We also look into um, assessing threats such as um, mortality from vehicles, from introduction of species, uh, whether it be dogs that are out in the island. So you are, if you go out to Catalina and you live on Catalina, you can have a dog and they don't have any requirements like they do in Hawaii where you have to demonstrate uh, vac uh, vaccine history before you can bring, bring your pet to the island. So there are dogs and cats that are on Catalina. They can become feral cats, which can uh, you know, introduce disease. And then you have um, the threats from emergent diseases. Next slide. So one of the ways we go and um, help with uh, supporting the conservation efforts with Friends of the Island Fox is we help support general health checks. So the foxes are counted twice a year, primarily um, in the summer months um, before the breeding season. So they, they've just kind of are wrapping up on the islands right now. Um, they'll do trapping uh, um, for uh, a kind of in these grids for a period of time when, and, they, and they'll check the animal for general health. Does it have a lot of ticks and fleas? What's its overall condition? Uh, the animal will get microchipped. They'll take blood samples. 
Uh, and as Carrie mentioned, some of the animals will get vaccinated against rabies and dis distemper to help protect the population if disease were to get into the islands. Next slide. And we also go and we support um, radio collars. So a new, a new collar is cost $350 and a refurbished collar is about $220, uh, $250. And um, due to limitations of the available frequencies, the National Park likes to reuse, there we go, Carrie has, is holding up a collar. The National Park likes to reuse and refit the collar. So they'll, they'll take them off. The foxes, they're cute little animals, but they're hard on radio collars. We monitor approximately 50 to 60 foxes per island. And these foxes are known as uh, sentinel foxes. They're typically young animals that have not yet been vaccinated. Um, and these, these sentinels are on the front line if disease or other threats were to emerge on the islands. They are the, the island early warning system. Now the, the collars have a mortality sensor in them. So you can see the little fox up there. So in that collar, there's a, a mortality mortality sensor that if the fox stops moving for approximately four hours, and if you've been to the islands, you see these foxes are like two-year-olds. They do not sit still. They'll plop down, they'll curl up, and two minutes later, they're off and moving again. So these, these, this collar will give off a signal if the fox doesn't move for, for approximately four hours and allows biologists to come out um, and retrieve the animal um, and they can send it out to, to, to determine cause of death. And from that, action can be taken if necessary. Next slide. So one of the other things that Friends of the Island Fox does um, is we help support uh, measures specific on each island. So on Catalina Island, uh, we help fund uh, fox saver bins, which replace the old style trash cans. Uh, foxes are notorious for getting into, into trash cans. They'll get in and they can't get out. Uh, and then unfortunately, they'll be in there. Uh, they'll starve or they'll succumb uh, for other reasons. Uh, we've helped fund the Watch for Foxes road signs. So out in Catalina, they, they can drive. And now they're driving uh, e-cars, which are actually faster than the, the golf carts that you see like on resorts and in Florida where people are driving around golf carts. These e-cars are now faster and they're creating more of a hazard to uh, foxes. In fact, on Catalina, one of the largest causes of mortality is vehicle strokes. Uh, we also fund uh, food, save, food saver boxes, which are essentially uh, the bear boxes that, that we have here in the mainland at the, the campgrounds around here. Next slide. Now, when we talk with, about biosecurity, what we're simply referring to are measures and protocols that must be employed to limit the island ecosystem for disease or invasive species. And biosecurity threats include dogs, feral cats, and animals transported from, from the mainland. And as you can see uh, from this picture, uh, a raccoon uh, hitched a ride on the Catalina Express. Um, and raccoons can spread canine diseases such as distemper. And as Carrie mentioned uh, just a few moments ago, uh, it was distemper that led to the, the catastrophic population crash on Catalina. Uh, and these are not one-off incidents that happen uh, in, in, in isolation. We had just the beginning of this year, a cat hitched a ride on a barge and ended up on San Nicolas Island. Um, luckily, it was caught in fairly short order before it could uh, start wreaking havoc on the ecosystem out there. Um, the cats will be out there. They'll, you know, they, 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 as feral cats here in our own area, you know, they'll, they'll easily kill birds, and they can just they can spread disease, and they can just really cause a, a mess on the island. Go ahead, Carrie. Next one. So one of the other things that we do is funding for uh viruses and virus testing so as you can see on this chart in 2015 um canine adenovirus arrived on 
Catalina Island and Scott, the, um, quickly moved through the population. So all these, you know, if we think about um, like COVID now, how quickly it's gone through the population here, when you get a novel virus to an island, um, A, these foxes are genetically uh, very similar. They're one of the least genetic variable animals on the planet. Um, so when you get introduced disease and viruses like this, they very quickly can spread through the population and they can wreak a lot of havoc. Fortunately, with the adenovirus, um, it hasn't been a high cause of mortality. Um, so we're very fortunate there, but other diseases can quickly run through a population. And we, and we look at these, and that's why blood samples are taken every year, and they're sent out and they look at uh, the titers of the, of the various diseases to ensure that we're not seeing spikes that can cause, cause problems later on um, that will need to be addressed. Next one. So one of the things that we also are, have become very active in is help funding research projects on the island. And this is, this is really exciting and um, it, it's really great because we've been connecting lately with a lot of great researchers. Um, in 2018 and 2019, we were supporting research into the diet of foxes through isotope analysis of the whiskers. Um, and simply put, uh, and you can go to the next slide, Carrie. Simply put, stable isotopes are atoms of an element that have different atomic masses than the typical atom of that element, right? So we're looking for, in this case, we're looking at carbon and nitrogen. Um, a fox, when it eats either plant or animal matter, some of the organic compounds from, that, from their diet get integrated into their own tissues and whiskers and as the saying goes, you are what you eat. And, and this can be, this leads a signature that um, researchers can look at to see specifically what foxes are, are, are uh, dining on. And their diet will, as Carrie mentioned, will vary by season. Um, and what they do is they're trying to adjust their foraging behavior to maximize calorie intake while minimizing the energy output for getting that food, right? So they're looking for the biggest bang for their buck. How, you know, how can I get that big nutrient intake without spending a lot of calories to get that? So they're looking at, you know, this means taking easy advantage of calorie rich food, um, food resources like the deer mice um, in the fall when you have th those large populations, uh, fruiting uh, trees that are fruiting or masting plants and insects as well. So a large part of their diet is insects. And based on the carbon nitrogen signature, you can tell what the animals are relying on resources. And this becomes really important uh, for the land managers to understand because as you're doing conservation efforts to the whole ecosystem, so not just for the fox, whole ecosystem, it's really important to understand what a fox is relying on. So for example, let's just, um, let's say that the foxes really love toyon trees, uh, which, which they do, they, they like the toyon. Well, let's just say toyon was an invasive plant. So they wanna go and they wanna get rid of toyon. But when you look at it, if the fox is really relying on that resource, you can't just remove it from its ecosystem and think that the fox is, is gonna be okay. So one of the challenges that, uh, the land managers, uh, like in the Navy Islands, that have used a lot of ice plant and to keep uh, cut down in erosion, foxes have started utilizing the ice plant in their diet. So now you just can't go in and rip out all that ice plant without expecting an impact to the fox population. So understanding what, how the foxes are resourcing themselves. Um, you know, helps land managers with conservation, and it also helps us kind of understand better what, how the foxes are utilizing their areas. Because we know uh, some foxes have become diet specialists where, they're, where they start to focus on just certain um, types of prey. Again, I'll just use the toyon, where they, they may feed heavily on toyon, and they're ignoring 
the other plants, maybe the prickly pear cactus or the cherry that's available to them. Uh, and it's kind of understanding why are they doing that and what, how, how does this, what does this mean uh, for the foxes out there? Next slide. And so another project that we've recently funded in 2019 was a research study that looks at cementum as a method to determine age fox at death. Now, cementum is a thin mineralized tissue covering the root surface of teeth, and it functions as a supporting uh, device to help anchor the, the tooth in the top into its socket. So if you were to, you know, above your gum line is all your enamel, and then down below you have a layer of cementum that helps anchor that, that tooth. But unlike bone, cementum is produced throughout one's life and forms annual layers and it makes it very useful in aging techniques. So what they do is they take a tooth, so you can see we have a, a canine tooth that's been extracted, that's processed, and it's sliced into thin micro sections, um, and it goes through a, a, a staining process so you can visualize those under a microscope. And they actually count the rings, and you can age a fox just like you count the rings and age a tree. Now we're looking to see, is this something that is reliable uh, determinant of age of foxes? So if we go to the next slide. So currently what they do to assess the age is when, we, they, when the foxes are trapped, they look at their teeth and they're looking at canine wear of the first upper molar. Now this is really imprecise uh, because it's influenced by diet. Uh, and it varies significantly between islands and even among habitats on the same island. As you can kind of see from the graph here, um, a fox that is aged one or two um, can be easily misclassified as an older fox based on that tooth wear. Next slide. So why is this really important? Well, knowing the age of death is very valuable. It allows the national park and the other land managers to, to track island fox lifespan. Um, this is important because a fox who dies at eight, nine, or 10 years old um, has been reproducing for a number of years, has had an opportunity to contribute to the survival of the species. A fox that dies at three or four may not have had a chance to replace itself in the population or pass on its genes. Um, and the thing that you, you want to see when you're doing um, the fox trapping and their aging is you want to see a nice distribution of ages. You don't want to see an island with really old foxes because that means they're going to be dying off and that population is going to ultimately um, you know, go down and it may go below a sustainable level. level. And nor do you want to see a really young population because you're going to end up kind of very flat. Uh, and you're not going to have that, that, that nice growth um, that means you have a high, healthy population. So if you have extremes, uh, you know something is happening on the island that may need to be addressed. So understanding when a fox dies really is an important uh, thing to understand for the land managers and the biologists who support the islands. So next, next slide. So there's so much that we can learn from island foxes that is applicable to other, other species. So it's not just, oh, we're doing this and it's just island fox and it's island fox uh, you know, uh, centric. We have um, the lady that's living up in Truckee, you know, out in her backyard, up in the forest there, she has the Sierra Nevada red fox lurking around. Um, and we've used the, or we, not we, but when they've recently put the, the Sierra Nevada red fox up for listing on the endangered species list, they use the population modeling from Catalina Island to figure out what is what should be a sustainable population of Sierra Nevada red foxes. So this, the information that we gather from the research into island foxes cuts across species and can be used elsewhere to help other endangered species. And we can all make a difference, uh, whether it's supporting friends of the island fox, 
or taking care when visiting the islands not to inadvertently leave food or trash. You know, we want that leave no trace uh, mentality when we go out to the island. Um, you'll see when you go out there, um, you know, the foxes, like you can see in this picture, um, Carrie's taking a picture of a fox and it's, it's kind of walking up to her. Uh, I go camping out there often and uh, my last trip, I, had a, I woke up and my hiking boots were about four feet away from my tent. I thought it was because it was really windy that night. They got blown over. Uh, the next night, I found out why a fox pup was coming and using it as a toy. Um, so they'll come right, they'll come right up to you. They don't see us as threats because humans were never a threat to them. So understanding that, understanding how to act out there is really important to help help that survival and keep keep our impact to a minimum. Now, if you'd like more information about island foxes, you know, you can subscribe to our newsletter. Please go to islandfox.org. Um, pretty soon, stay tuned because we're going to have an announcement coming out very soon of another research project that we're funding. Uh, we're making that decision now and we're going to be announcing it in probably within the next couple of weeks. And one of the things that, that I'm working on is I'm going to be writing up some blogs about other foxes in uh, North America. We have six species of fox that resides in no North America. Four of them are in California. Uh, and we're going to be sharing some knowledge about the other foxes that that share our neighborhood here. Oh, I see. I, I got a round of applause from, from Jess. <laughs> So with that, Carrie, do you have any, any closing marks? And I see we have some questions popping up in the chat box too. Well, I would add that uh, the fox is benefiting from the San, Qu San Joaquin Valley uh, kit fox because that's where they did the first radioisotope uh, analysis of diet for foxes. And then they carried it over to, to the island foxes. So all of these little guys helping to support each other's populations. And uh, some of, more of the island foxes research is going to eventually be important for the San Joaquin kit fox because it's also now starting to live in islands of habitat but they're not surrounded by water, they're surrounded by agriculture and they're surrounded by people. And the same with, with what Mike was saying about the red fox up in the Sierra Nevadas, these different isolated populations are all benefiting from the research that is going on with the island fox because we're seeing differences in the subspecies and how the different small populations are impacted and that is the same kind of thing we're seeing even with the, the mountain lions here in Southern California that are isolated in the different mountain islands of ecosystem. So the more we know about all these different species, they actually help to inform management for the others as well. I'm gonna come out of this. Come back here with you. Hey. Oh, okay. So we got a couple, couple questions. I see. Uh, am I supposed to be reading the questions? But um, yeah, go ahead. Go uh, okay. ahead. Read them, read so them. we have we have like um, direct interactions of foxes with domestic dogs on Catalina, and attitude towards foxes on Catalina. So yes, you you do have the risk with the with people having their pet dog out there, um, especially when they, you know, if they go out hiking and they, they let them run around, it's gonna be the same uh, kind of interactions that you have, you know, in Harmon Canyon, for example, give a plug mm -hmm. to, to Harmon Canyon. If people let their dogs run around on, uh, you know, preserve property, it, they're gonna chase, they're gonna wanna chase the fox. Um, the, the, mm, Foxes probably around Avalon are a little bit wary of the dogs, but foxes farther out are not going to be. And we kind of see that um, not so much the with with dogs because they, they don't exist, but you see the interaction with foxes on Santa Cruz and humans differently um, than you do on Santa Rosa Island. So when I'm on Santa Cruz, 
um, where I spend most of my time when I'm on the islands is on cruise. Um, there are times when foxes are a tripping hazard. I've had them on a trail in front of me. I'll move, it'll move one step. We'll stop and stare at each other. I'll move, it'll move a step. And we'll have this little dance going on. Uh, on Santa Rosa, the fox is a little more leery. They'll see me come in. Um, they'll, they'll quickly go off into the brush and watch, watch, watch me go by. So you have, you, I think be, because of what is in the area around them, they behave a little bit differently. And they're going to be doing this on uh, Catalina as well. But really one of the biggest threats with the dog is going to be introduced disease because foxes and dogs share those same diseases. So it's, it's going to be easily transferred. Transfer. I, I just want to jump in here for a second because we do see one or two foxes every year on Catalina that are killed by dogs. So um, the, the fox has, it just doesn't see itself as prey in the same way that other mainland foxes do. And every once in a while, it causes a problem for them. They, they will be chased by dogs. And then we have had, we, it typically a couple every year on Catalina get killed by dogs. All right, we're gonna give a shout out. We got a, we got a friend, we, we're, we're being watched from the islands as well. We oh my gosh. Out. Yeah. Hi, Lisa. So, hey. Oh, yeah. hey, Miguel. Hopefully the weather is nice out there. Yeah, Miguel can be a rough, a rougher island with the winds. That's hardy being out there. All right, so what other questions do we have? Um, when the foxes were, in, were reintroduced um, onto the islands, did the behaviors of the other animals, like the skunks and the mice that had, that had adapted in the absence of the foxes, did those habits return to normal or did the mice now have a taste for bird eggs and the skunks knew where they could find new food? Did those things settle at, with, with, the, with the balance or, or are those new behaviors that have, they've, they've taken on? So that's a really good question. And in both cases with the deer mice and then also with the spotted skunks, there are researchers out there looking at that right now to determine if they're seeing a, a return to the way it was before. And it's a very rare opportunity to see that, to see what it happens in an ecosystem when the top predator is gone and then to see how things revert when it's reintroduced. We do know that the number of spotted skunks out on the islands on Santa Cruz and on Santa Rosa appears to be declining rapidly, but we don't know what all of the causes are for that. We don't know if it's directly connected to the foxes increase or if it's connected to other things as well. So there's a lot of research that's going on right now looking at those things. So there's still there's still a lot that we don't we don't know out on the islands that we're we're still learning, uh, and they're great real life real world laboratories, um, and we're so fortunate to have them right off our coast here in, in Southern California. I mean we have what, 20 million people, 200 million people. What is it? I think it's 20 20 million, 25 million people right here in the Southern California Bight. And we have this great island ecosystem, you know, 24 miles off our coast. Uh, and it's just incredible. And, and we have so, so many opportunities to learn so much more that can be valuable, again, you know, across species um, and, and, help, and help other, other island communities, other, you know, mainland communities, and, and, and small populations like the Sierra Nevada Red Fox. Mm -hmm. Those are interesting parallels between the Sierra Nevada fox and the other fox that you mentioned that had such limited habitat that they were that they had kind of island habitats too. It's interesting to draw those yeah. Yeah. connections. They're 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 isolated. You had mentioned that those foxes are really hard on the collars. What are they doing to the collars? <laughs> when when they rough when they rough house, um, you know they're they they act like you know they'll act like puppy when they're small right. and young, when they're younger uh, they roughhouse 
Um, what's are, really cool about pups will yeah, grab this, them and chew on them if their yeah, mother's wearing one. Yeah. Mm. So one of the neat things with um, island foxes and island species is because they're limit, they're you know they're limited. So Santa Cruz Island is 96 square miles. Um, there's 2,200 foxes out there. So you have about 10 foxes per square kilometer out there or so. Um, they have to kind of get along. So it's not like these, um, you know, larger populations of, of, of big carnivores that need tons of space and they don't mingle. Um, they have to learn how to get along. Uh, and one of the things they end up doing is they end up rough housing and then they end up destroying callers. Okay, we've got a couple more questions. Should I let you read them? Wondering why there aren't any local regulations about vaccinations, etc. <laughs> that's a good question. That is a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, is the city, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Carrie, you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, I, I know that um, the Catalina Island Conservancy has tried for years to get the government in Avalon to enforce vaccination, especially for dogs. But they see anything that's like that that could potentially limit people from coming out to the island as a tourist as a potential detriment to the island economically. So the local community has really pushed back against it. And it's really a shame because it also would make the island safer for their own pets. So it's um, hopefully, you know, things can change. We've seen dramatic change across the islands. We used to have two islands that had large feral cat populations. And everybody thought nothing could be done about that. But it, on the two Navy islands, the feral cat population has been resolved. And initially, it was going to be a bloodbath. I mean, they were just going to go out and kill the cats. And uh, when we found out about that, we said, is there really anything else we can try to do? because the public's gonna find out about this, they're gonna ask us. And it's, good, it's not gonna be good for the Navy, it's not gonna be good for foxes. And they opened it up for public uh, discussion and comment and locally down in San Diego, the Humane Society down there, they came to the table, discussions happened between the Navy and the Humane Society and they went through a process where cats, feral cats were trapped if they were diseased, they were euthanized. If they weren't, then the Humane Society of San Diego paid for those cats to come to the mainland and they paid for a facility to keep them for the rest of their lives. And kittens were fostered out. So it was a, it was a good resolution of something, of a problem that everybody thought couldn't be done. So, you know, sometimes it just takes a little bit longer than it would if you could go in and just enforce things to get everybody on the table. They have, uh, what is it, capture, neuter, release out on Catalina for the feral cat population out there. It still leaves a lot of cats and cats with, have a much longer lifespan than island foxes do. And the cats are more carnivorous, so they really eat a lot of the resources that the fox depends on. Mm. So, we would love to see more effort to reduce the feral cat population on Catalina, but that's a really emotional issue for a lot of people out on Catalina. Yeah. So let's see, we have a question. Who's doing most of the research? Um, you know, it's really, it's the bulk of the research is being conducted by um, universities. The, the, the National Park, um, and we help, uh, at times I think we help up the National Park, we help them a lot, uh, especially with radio callers. Um, but a lot of the research that's going on is coming from, from universities. Um, UC Davis uh, was heavily involved, um, and we're seeing uh, a lot of other uh, 
large institutions kind of come in um, and doing, you know, different types of work um, acro across the islands. Um, right. So you see Santa Barbara is looking at the intertidal zone and right. they've expanded yep. their research into how foxes are using the beach areas. Yep. Um, we're hoping that that's going to intermesh point. with our whisker isotope research because it, it's, it's looking like that there are some beaches that are more productive with resources than other beaches, depending on how the currents are and how the beach is facing out to the ocean. And that becomes important for identifying which beaches are important for island foxes so that they could potentially be protected. And that research might turn out to be applicable to other islands. Um, so we also have um, Northern, University of Northern Arizona involved with uh, looking at tick-borne disease and uh, University of New Mexico, they're part of the isotope study. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to bring in as many people who want to get involved with island foxes as we can. Um, but most of them are I would say master students and PhD students. Yeah, and a lot of the funding, someone was asking about um, the funding. So we try, you know, one of the goals of Friends of the Island Fox is, is raising funds to help support uh, research grants. Um, and then it's a lot of the researchers, they're doing it like all other researchers are doing it, looking at, you know, the grant populations that are available um, to get funding to help, to help support that. Um, we're trying to get our name out more so that we can reach a broad audience to, to let them know that, hey, we can help you, you know, specifically with, with box funding as we can. And you let us know what you need and, you know, we'll try to go out and, um, and, get, and help raise funds. Um, and then somebody asked, oh, human-fox interaction. Com is it common for foxes to approach humans? Um, Yes, I think mostly in, you, you know, when you go out to Santa Cruz Island and you're in a campground area, yes. Um, when you're in a campground on Santa Rosa Island, yeah, they'll, they'll come in. You know, I'll be making dinner out in Santa Rosa and I'll have a fox at the end of the, the picnic table and, and getting underneath and everything. Um, so it is common for them to, to come up to us. Again, they don't see us as a threat. Um, we, we didn't, you know, in modern times, we haven't gone out hunting the foxes. They weren't a fur bearing species for us. So they didn't, they haven't developed a fear of humans. Um, and that's, you know, that, that makes it really, you know, kind of cool to be out there. Uh, and you get to watch a carnivore, uh, in action. And, um, when you camp out there, it's kind of really special to see and hear and be part of, of those interactions out in the island. Oh, is there still a Oh, okay. Is there still a concentration of DDT in the ocean that might affect foxes using marine resources? The answer is yes. Um, off of is it San Pedro. Slide. Yeah, off of San Pedro, uh, Montrose Chemical Company um, ended up dumping a large amount of DDT into the waters um, that led into um, the area off San Pedro and Los Angeles. Uh, because DDT doesn't really break down in the marine environment, um, it's essentially an underwater Superfund site. Um, and Montrose Chemical Company um, had to pay billions in fines that have supported a lot of the seabird recovery efforts that have occurred out in the islands um, as late as 2018. I'm not sure if they're still any money left from that? That was from the 1970s, I believe. Yeah. That that um, you know that that uh, that 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 fine uh, was placed on them, and so that money has been spent from the 1970s up until uh, about a year or two ago. So yes, off of there, there's still that that risk, and they have found DDT in. Um, some of the, the, the seabirds out there. Um, so it is still a possible threat out there. It, it is a, it's a concern that uh, people are still watching. We had a female bald eagle two years ago who 
She was born out on the islands and has lived out there her whole life. Um, she had started to become a breeder. She was successful breeding her first year. And then it was either the second or the third year, she had a couple of egg failures. And so there was some concern. Um, they tried to ascertain if it was DDT that was causing the problem with the eggshells. I never heard anything specific on that, but I do know that the following year, she successfully bred. So um, it is definitely something that everybody is concerned about. Um, and, and still to this day, you should not consume fish uh, that are bottom feeders from that area where the LA River goes out in, at Long Beach um, because that's where the DDT was dumped in the LA River and it, the biggest plume of it is right there at Long Beach. Um, and any fish that is caught along there that's not a bottom feeder that you're gonna eat should be cooked in a way that the fat drips out of it because the DDT, this is, this is the insidious thing about it is it stays in the fat of the animal and it, you don't get rid of it. It stays in your body. And so that's true for fish. And if you consume it, you're consuming that, putting it into your own body. And pregnant women are advised not to eat fish at all from that area. Interesting, did we hit all the- okay. Yeah, and we did. And uh, thanks, Chris. Chris mentioned that the Montrose funding is, is all gone. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's what I thought I heard about. But what's really exciting about the the, the eagles, um, I think there's 50 to 60 eagles now that uh, call the Northern Islands home, and we're actually they're actually finding and they tag them. So every year, uh, when the eagles are born, they get uh, the eaglets get tagged, um, and they're now finding them on the mainland. So um, the island islands are reaching their once again carrying capacity for for bald eagles and they're starting to uh, expand their range uh, out to the main So that's really a success story when you look at the fox the eagle uh, and a lot of the recovery uh, efforts that have gone out on the island it's really been um, a tremendous success story so when we want to do something right um, we can do it and um, and have a good a really good ending so is there any, any other, any other questions? <laughs> Boxes, bald eagles, and peregrine yes, falcons. Yes, peregrine falcons too, yep. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's, I mean, a great story of recovery and of information gathering and learning from our mistakes yeah. <laughs> and a wonderful opportunity to learn how the environment adapts all around that. So thank you so, so much yeah, for being here, yeah, joining yeah. us. Thank you. And if you want more, islandfox.org, you can find us on Facebook, uh, Instagram. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And Twitter. And Twitter. Yeah. Great. And um, please become a member of Ventura Land Trust. We just opened our, our signature nature preserve, Harmon Canyon Preserve, to the public in June. It's 2,100 acres in Ventura. Um, and it's free to the public every day, dawn to dusk. So um, come see us there, become a member at VenturaLandTrust.org. Um, and please reach out if you'd like to be more involved. Yeah, and if you see me out on the islands, please stop by and say hi. Yes, we will. Yeah. <laughs> and welcome, Claire. We'll, we'll love to see you down here. Yes. Well, thank All you, right. everybody. Thank uh, you. Thank you, guys. That was great. Thank you. See Thanks, you Jess. at the next one. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.